Spring practice is here, and this is not going to be your standard run-of-the-mill spring practice preview for the University of Georgia. Not on this week's How About That Dogs Cast. No, like I try to do every week is I want to come with you guys or come to you guys with something that is not something you're going to get everywhere else. Now, yes, sports journalism is my career. Yes, I've been doing it for a quarter century. However, and I've said this many times, I'm not on the beat for the Georgia Bulldogs. There are other guys in the market who do that and do it very, very well. There are other Georgia Bulldog hmm, commentators here on YouTube that will give you a breakdown, position by position, player by player. They'll give you those insider notes that the coaches may feed them, you know, leave crumbs, bread trails, and stuff like that. But that's not what I'm going to bring to you. What I'm going to bring to you tonight is we're definitely going to talk about the dogs. There's no way around that. I mean, spring practice is literally just days away. Um, and I'm very excited for it to get here, as I'm sure you all are. But what I want to do is take a look at it in a way that maybe uh, the fan is going to look at it, right? So that's the perspective I'm going to take. I'm going to give you tonight five different areas uh, where I'm going to look for specific things as spring practice plays out, and then especially what I might like to see during the G-Day game this year. <clears throat> now, whenever you're talking about actually playing football, we're not talking about workouts or or anything like that. We're not talking about recruiting rankings. We're not talking about all of the off-season talk where people rated this uh, position group or this position room or who has the best new coaching staff or who came in, who left the churn of the offseason. That's not what I'm going to be focused on. I'm just going to touch on some top of the tree kind of stuff and then maybe pull you down into the limbs just a little bit in a few certain areas. So that's what I hope to get into this evening. <clears throat> and for me, there's nothing more important when we talk about the 2024 football season than what's going to happen along Georgia's defensive line this year. And I say that not because I'm overly concerned that there's no talent there, because there is or that I feel like there's no quality depth at the position because there is, it could be better. But there are a lot of players along the defensive line for Georgia that have played a lot of snaps between the hedges and elsewhere in very, very big moments for the Bulldogs. There is quality depth along the defensive line. That's not something I'm concerned about. But... I think the thing that most all of us could say that we've heard during the offseason is that when you looked at what Georgia did along the defensive line in 2023, the thing that was missing was what had been there the previous two seasons, which is you had a player that could single-handedly wreck a game. Whether it was 2021, you had Jordan Davis in there with Devontae Wyatt, or if it were 2022 where you had Jalen Carter who – could blow up a game. Essentially, I mean, think back to the Tennessee game uh, in that championship season. Jalen's play down at the goal line, there was a prime opportunity after a wonderful punt by Brett Thorson, pinned Tennessee back. Everybody in the stadium knew that Tennessee was either going to have to earn their way off the goal line and make a big drive, which could have been huge for the Volunteers, or Georgia had the opportunity to make a game-changing play there. And that's exactly what happened. Jalen took it upon himself to get after the passer, make a play, and then the very next play, after the turnover, the dogs put it in from midfield. Stetson to Lad McConkey, big touchdown. The game was over. It was over. The momentum exploded in the stadium. The dogs had it from there on out. The game was over. So that's not the kind of play that we saw last year from Georgia's defensive line. They were very steady. In some ways, they were better than the edge players for Georgia last year in the impact that they had on the game. Now, with that said, we had some things happen here in the offseason where the players who play along that defensive line for Georgia decided, you know what, 
I recognize that I can do better, that there is room for me to grow, that there is money on the table for me in a moving year. And I'm going to come back to Georgia and try to capitalize on that opportunity. If we talk about players like Nazir Stackhouse or Warren Brinson, those two guys have been really, really good football players for the University of Georgia during their time in Athens. Neither of them had the impact week in and week out last season that I think they expected of themselves. I know that Brinson, when people talk about him, they think of him as more of a twitchy, get after the pass rush, uh, passer kind of guy. That's not exactly what we saw. He played really well. He flashed, especially in the back half of the season. But that didn't translate to the disruption that I'm certain he expected himself to create. When we look at Stackhouse, of course, he had the big play against Missouri. And he was consistent over the course of the season against the run. Some weeks better than others, but overall, very consistent. But of course, the thing everybody remembers about that game or about that player, Stackhouse, is that when we got to the uh, SEC championship game and the dogs didn't have depth that they could trust at that point in the season along the defensive line, they got tired. And, of course, Stackhouse didn't do so well against the run. Those big linemen from Alabama were able to move the dogs when it mattered most. So not only am I looking at the defensive line for more consistency and to see those guys maybe take advantage and make good on their decision to come back. I'm also looking for the defensive line to, to fill the role that when you think about Kirby's defense, they have to fill. Now, there are a couple of names here that I haven't even mentioned yet, and I'm going to get to them. Don't worry. But the thing that the Georgia defense, the defensive line, has to be able to do here in 2024 is set the posts for the defense that Kirby likes to play. Think of it as a picket fence. You anchor down those defensive linemen so that they can play more than one gap. Now, not everybody has the ability to do that because of their build, but the players who are coming back for Georgia in 2024 do have that ability, specifically a player like Nazir Stackhouse, to be able to anchor down and then play both head up and then the gap to either side. That's going to free up your linebackers to be able to run. That's going to give you more options in the pass rush game if a player can do that. Occupy one blocker or two then obviously you're going to have a free runner on the defensive side of the football. So the biggest thing I'm looking for is, and this includes Warren Brinson and Zier Stackhouse, are we going to have that breakthrough player? That doesn't mean that they're going to be what Jordan Davis or Devontae Wyatt or Jalen Carter were in terms of disruption. It means, are they going to make good on the bet that they made on themselves to break through and be that player that shows up every week. That player that every week you are going to see pushing the pocket back in on the quarterback on a pass play. You're going to see completely clogging up the middle by, by shutting down that interior run game. Consistently. Not flashing throughout the course of a game. But are they going to show up every week? I think that Stackhouse and Brinson both have the ability to make that happen. The good news is they're not alone. There are going to be some guys that Georgia bet on a couple of years ago that are absolutely going to have to show up and show, prove that they are everything that the dogs thought they were. Now with a couple of years in the system, a couple of years in the weight room, a couple of years of better understanding what it is that they're asked to do inside Kirby's defense. Players like Jordan Hall, former five-star, Tyrion Ingram Dawkins, somebody who's been around the program for a few years now, who is in a moving year. This is the year that if it, Dawkins is going to make a push to be an NFL draft pick and make some money down the road, this is the year he needs to show up. Now, for him, a lot of that has to do with staying healthy. If he can stay healthy, that's a name that we should see make an impact for the dogs this fall. 
Kristen Miller is a guy that even though he might be considered to be a little bit undersized at about 285, 290, he just seems to keep popping up. He seems to keep making plays. And then, of course, we have Jamal Jarrett. Now, you may have seen it a little while back. Jaw, he had a, they call him Jaw. He had a, uh, an Instagram reel that went sort of viral where he was out there working on his speed, his straight line speed. And the big man was moving. And he looked to be a lot slimmer than when he first showed up in Athens. If you have Jordan Hall and Ja Jarrett take that big step that everybody in the program expects them to take, then that's going to take so much pressure out of, off of Stackhouse and Brinson. And then we're going to see those guys be able to deploy the rest of their game and not just be a plugger there in the middle to take up blockers for the backers and where they have to manufacture pass rush. You're going to see a Warren Brinson with more fresh legs be able to push that pocket on his own and show up on his own on second down without having to create pressure off the edge. So, yeah, who are going to be those breakthrough players for Georgia along the defensive line this year? Not break out, break through. There is talent in the room. It's just that most people couldn't tell you who they are. If Georgia has a really good 2024, that will change. You will learn the name Warren Brinson, Jordan Hall, Jamal Jarrett, Tyrion Ingram Dawkins. So that's one of the things I'm going to be looking for in spring practice. I'm going to be looking for the reports about that defensive line. Because if they set the tone for what this defense should be, then Georgia's going to have a pretty good season. Now, I have said earlier this year in other videos, in other live streams, that as we start the season, as we start spring practice, I fully expect the offense – to be in front of the defense. I expect that the offense is going to have to carry that defense and carry maybe a little strong, but they're going to cover for that defense the first part of the year as they sort of find their feet, get into their rotations. Everybody sort of figures out who's going to lock down which positions and which roles. The offense should provide plenty of air cover for the defense to figure that out. So I'm definitely going to be paying attention to what we see in spring practice and every day through fall camp to see how quickly that unit gels and comes together and who's making waves going up what is going up against what is undoubtedly one of the best offensive lines in the conference, if not in the country. So it's going to be really, really must see viewing for me as we make our way uh, through all of these practice sessions headed towards G-Day. So the defensive line, that's one area. Now the other area, this area, the next area, it is an area that's sort of, well, I mean, if I'm being honest with you, it just, it just makes me giddy. Because have you ever, like, been doing anything in life or, or see something like, have you ever just been uh, in, in an area where you saw a beautiful rainbow and you just looked up at it and you're like, man, that's just, man, I'm going to stop for a second and take that in. That's so pretty. That's so pretty. Or even a double rainbow. What about that? That's how I feel when I think about Georgia's linebacker room. When I think about their edge players, I just think about that unit and think, oh, this is the year, man. This is the year that all of this stuff is going to come together. This is the year that all of these dudes, all of these top-tier pass rushers that we've heard about so much for the last two years that the dogs have been bringing in, this is the year that I expect to see those guys really pop off and break out. They're just so pretty. I just want to watch them play. They look good on the hoof, fast, aggressive, strong. Oh, I want to see it. I want to see it. I'm so excited because of what I think can happen. Think about everything we just said about the defensive line. If even most of that happens, this unit that we're talking about right now, this linebackers, this edge unit, they are going to become superstars 
in 2024. I mean, Smile Munden's back. We weren't certain he was going to choose to come back to the University of Georgia, but he did. He got dinged up last year, felt like he did not play to the level that he knows he can play. When Smile is right, there is not a linebacker in the country that I would take ahead of him. The guy who sort of made his own way last year, made the most of his opportunities last year. C.J. Allen is another player that I'm looking forward to seeing a lot from here in 2024. And I'm not going to skip right past Raylan Wilson there either. And there, the thing is, I could just keep listing off names here because there's so many that I don't want to forget. Troy Balls, Troy Foster, right? Jalen Walker. They're names I don't want to forget here because I'm so excited about all of them and the way they're going to fit together to make this defensive unit what it can be. There is no doubt that that room is ultra talented. No doubt. The thing is, how have they done behind the scenes over the last year and a half to two years? What kind of work have they been able to accomplish in the weight room, when nobody's looking, when they are alone with their thoughts and relying on the fact that they are completely bought in to what Kirby Smart and Glenn Schumann have told them, and they understand that the only way that they can be their very best is to buy into the program and do what they're asked to do, do their job. This is the year we find out. So my question is, who will be the linebacker or edge player to rise among this group and lead the way? You would think it might be Smile because he has the most time in. A guy like Chaz Chambliss, potentially. That's going to be the leader of the group. You would think. But then you've got a, a kid who, who came in last year, C.J. Allen, and played quality snaps and played very, very well. That's a very early contender to be another leading voice in that room, both on the field and off. The way I see it shaking out for this room is everybody eats. Everybody is going to make hay in 2024. That's truly what I expect. I know I'm saying I want to wait and see, and I do, but I have so much anticipation about what this group is going to look like I mean, I just see a bunch of missiles lined up there behind the line of scrimmage, but you know, three, four feet off the ball. And it's just, how does Kirby and Glenn Schumann, how do they want to use them? You want to drop them back into pass coverage? You want to put them on man? Think of the matchups that these guys are going to give the dogs. Raylan Wilson, C.J. Allen, Smile Munden, all those dudes can run. Every last one of them. They can cover any back, any tight end inside the conference that's not on Georgia's team. The options that the defensive masterminds in Athens are going to have, it, it, it just gets me so excited, it's hard to put it into words. And wait, it gets better. Like I said, I expect everyone to eat in this room. I expect all of them to be playmakers, certain roles, rotating in. But here's the thing that people forget about. This, well, not forget about it. Actually, it's one of the talking points. We're coming up on the draft right now. We're coming, So we're going to see it. So let's look at it through the draft lens. This is a position that is so star-studded with talent that when the NFL looks at what Georgia has at the linebacker position, they're like, oh, yeah, this looks familiar because that's the way the NFL plays these days. They are very, very situational. They have specialists who come in and rush the passer or play on third down, cover the backs, all that sort of stuff. That's the way Georgia uses their linebackers. Depends on the package they want to run. Down and distance, scheme, all that sort of stuff. Each week it changes. So when the NFL draft guys look at who's being developed, they look at the University of Georgia and say, yeah, this looks really familiar. Now, when you look at it that way, Think about what Georgia has at their disposal right here. Think about what they're going to be able to do, the chess pieces they're going to be able to move, the headaches they're going to be able to create for opponents here in 2024. Now, obviously, 
we have to, you know, we're hoping everybody's healthy and all those sorts of things. So I think that goes without saying, but there I said it just to be sure. If all of these guys are healthy and ready to go, this unit is just going to be playmaker after playmaker after playmaker. They're going to be fighting to see who can get the last meat off the bone. It's going to be like, uh, what is it? Uh, a feeding frenzy, that's what they call it, with like the piranhas in the water. You know what I mean? Like you throw you throw something in the water and the water's calm. You throw something in there and then all of a sudden there's this big turmoil and a bunch of bubbles and everything because of the feeding frenzy. That's what it's going to be for this Georgia linebacker group. That's what I expect. I, I, can you tell how fired up I am about it? Because I really think that's what we're going to see. They're going to be trying each week, each day, each rep, to up one another and be better because that's what they're going to have to do to have the opportunity to get out there and make a play. Man, I'm excited. Can you tell? Man, I'm excited. And then here we go. I haven't even got to the best part yet. Like here's the part that could blow your mind. But before I do that, I want to show you this video. Check out. Now, Georgia just went on spring practice or spring practice. Georgia just went on spring break. Okay. Okay. Had a little time at home, um, or a quiet time, let me put it that way. It was a little bit of a dead period. They had a chance to get home. They had a chance to do some work away from the coaches, the coaching staff, and uh, being away from the practice fields. I want you to check out a piece of video that I don't think got enough run, so I wanted to run it on here. But this is Damon Wilson back home working, not a Georgia coach in sight. This is a young man, and let's talk about Damon Wilson for just a second. A five-star recruit out of Florida who everybody looked at and said, tremendous ability. He's going to be a star. And then he gets on campus. Georgia had a, a big recruiting battle against Ohio State. And at the end of the day, Wilson decided to come to Athens because of proven productivity at the position. And when he got to Athens, the very first interview I heard from Damon Wilson, he did not sound like an 18-year-old kid. He sounded like a 24-year-old man who had a vision and a plan and fully understood why he was in Athens at the University of Georgia. And he knew why he had made his choice to come to Athens, saying stuff like, yeah, I don't really like to go out and hang out downtown or anything like that. I usually just get my food and hang out in my house or my room or whatever. And they're like, you don't hit it on downtown? He's like, no, nothing down there for me. I came here to work. I have a goal, very goal-driven, very goal-oriented. We saw Wilson get on the field in 2023, and he had, I think his, his total number of tackles was something like four. He had a half a sack or something. It came against Florida. But he was in there on the rotation, and he understood his job was to provide pressure on the passer. I saw one just recently, speaking of interviews, where they went back and chatted with Damon a little bit again, and he was like, yeah, I learned last year as a freshman. I spent a year putting on weight, adding muscle. He's like, my job is to pressure the passer situationally get after the passer, make life awful for the opposing quarterback and offensive coordinator. Very clear on his job. So when everybody else had a moment of downtime, this is what Damon Wilson was doing. Hey. Oh, my goodness. Whoa. The name I haven't even mentioned is something that bubbled up back around the time of the bowl game. Michael Williams had to sit down with the coaches. And there were some rumors out there that he was thinking about entering the transfer portal. But after he sat down with the coaches and got a good understanding of what their plan was going to be for him, both uh, in the bowl game and then in 2024, he's like, no, Georgia's good. This is where I want to be. We all saw what Williams did as a true freshman. He came through, garnered some uh, freshman honors, and then in 2024, hampered by injury most of the year, 
People looked at Williams and said, man, what happened? What, what happened to the guy we saw last year? Why isn't he that guy wrecking games for the dogs? Well, injuries. Simple as that. And then if you did put a second layer on it, it was because of the way they were trying to use him, which brings us back to the depth and usage of the players that were on the defensive line with him last year. They were trying to figure out the best way for Williams to impact the game. And most of the time, that meant he had his hand in the dirt. Playing more of a defensive end edge position than a stand-up outside linebacker who is primarily focused on getting after the quarterback on passing downs. So the coaches sat Michael down and said, here, look, here's how we're going to use you. Then they go out and play the bowl game. And what do we see with 13? We see him standing up. They see him on the edge. We see him in the middle, much like what happened with Travon Walker the longer he was in Athens. I think, I am confident that the coaches know what they have in Michael Williams. And I think in 2024, we're going to see him unleashed. You're going to see him all over the defensive line, depending on the down and distance, depending on the situation in the game. And if these younger players that I spoke about before are doing their jobs the way everyone expects them to do, he's going to have more fresh legs than what we saw last year. And I think we're going to see 13 just wrecking stuff for the dogs this year. Think about the video we just saw of Damon Wilson. Now put Michael Williams out there with him in the same package. There are a lot of other names here I haven't even gotten to yet. There are other names that I haven't even pointed out. Let's do this. I want to make sure I don't miss anybody. Like I said, what about Samuel and Pemba, true freshman last year? Sam and Pemba, last year, this time of year, because he came in as a mid-year, looked like a different kind of human. All he needed to do was figure out what to do. And as the season went along, he, like Wilson, was getting on the field more and more often to try to put pressure on the passer. But Jalen Walker, Sam and Pemba, Damon Wilson, Michael Williams, think about those dudes in special packages pinning their ears back and getting after the quarterback. That's scary, man. I don't care if it's Carson Beck back there, the best quarterback in the country returning to college football. If he looked out there and saw those four dudes, he's definitely going to drop his eyes. You can't help to. It's human nature. But as we all know, college football, you know, one hand washes the other. For these guys to be able to have the kind of impact I'm talking about, that means that the defensive line is going to have to be able to win on first and second down. So that brings us right back to Jordan Hall, Kristen Miller, Nazir Stackhouse, Warren Brinson. And then, oh yeah, there's a whole bunch of freshmen coming in with them too. Now, I'm not telling you that these freshmen that are coming in in this class are going to line up and play for the dogs on the defensive line this fall. There's one or two that might. But I'm just saying, depth, no longer a concern. Roster management by Kirby Smart and his coaching staff have filled the holes and there's talent everywhere along the defensive line, at linebacker, and at edge for the Georgia Bulldogs. And I am very, very excited. So, yeah, I'm going to be watching the defensive line, how they mature and grow up. I'm going to be watching those linebackers and edge players because, oh, man, it's like, it's like pick the thing you care the most about. You like fast cars, right? You like, I don't know, rainbows, like I said before. I am so excited about watching these guys get out there and get after the passer this year. I think this is going to be an area that people may have thought Georgia doesn't have an answer. I'm telling you they have answers. Which one of them is going to be the ones that are going to pop up and make plays? That's all I need to know. I just want to see who that is. I don't doubt it. I just want to see who it is. Very excited about that. Now, 
let's keep this thing moving and let's stay on the defensive side of the ball because like I said everything works hand in glove right everything has to work together so if the defensive line wins on first and second down that gives those linebackers and edge players an opportunity to get after the passer on second and third down right but of course, you got to have people in the back end who are taking care of their business as well. And if you were going to point to the Georgia defense this year and say, where are they softest? Where are the most questions on the Georgia defense? It would have to be in the back end. I mean, just look at what they lost, right? Kamari Laster, Javon Bullard. Now, if there were a position, you, it, the DB position, defensive back position, is a position that you simply cannot have enough athletic players. You just cannot do it because those are the kind of players that play everywhere else on your football team if they're not out there with a starting 11, okay? So I'm talking about uh, gunners on punt and kickoff. I'm talking about any of the special teams where you need a speed guy, a long body to run and block or uh, potentially, uh, like I say, get down and cover on the punt. Think about the fact that Brett Thorson... Uh, and the Georgia Bulldogs did not allow a single punt return yard last year. Not one led the country. That is unfathomable. I never even thought that was a statistic that you could like even, that would even have a possibility of happening. Somewhere along the way, maybe Thorson shanks one or, or something. Somebody creases us, you know, and hits a big gainer or something. No, the dogs didn't allow a single punt return yard last year because of those gunners, because of the athletes that aren't in the starting 11 for the University of Georgia, but are players, those outside linebackers, those linebackers, those DBs, those wide receivers. Jimmy's, Jimmy's and Joe's, not X's and O's. So let's look at the defensive backs right here. You can't have enough good ones. And there are a lot of, yeah, battles, let's call it battles, in the secondary this year for who's going to step up and get playing time. And I don't mean to be disrespectful to any of the people that are currently in the defensive back room for the University of Georgia. I mean, there are some tremendous players there that I'm not going to be able to spend any time at all talking about tonight, okay? But there are a few that I really want to see, and that's what spring practice is about. Everybody wants to know what guys look good and where they're lining up and that sort of stuff. And I'm no different. When it comes to the defensive backs for Georgia, there are a few names that I'm really going to pay attention to. The first one is Jonel Aguero. Five-star uh, recruit last season, played for Georgia last year, saw some time uh, in game, but certainly on special teams, had a blocked punt against Florida. This is the year that I think they're going to put Janelle Aguero on the field and turn him loose. I saw an interview with Aguero recently where he was back home and he was like, he was talking about the stuff that every freshman talks about, especially at a place like the university of Georgia, where he said it was tough. I felt like I could have been doing more. And most of that was driven by his own, uh, internal drive, his pressure that he puts on himself to be the best he can possibly be. And he would see, he said there were moments last season where he saw other guys making plays and he thought to himself, man, I could do that. I could do that. And then he went on to admit, but I hadn't done it consistently enough to be able to be on the field to prove it. And he told everyone on that interview that this is the year that he's going to show everybody who he is. Now, nothing wrong with being confident in yourself, but I, for one, actually believe it. I think there's no way that Janelle Aguero is not starting for Georgia's defensive secondary at some position, whether it's at the safety position or at the star. I think you're absolutely going to see this young man there because there's been a lot of talk about the college football uh, video game that's coming back this year. I played that game so long ago that before everything went online, you could still do dynasty mode and build players and go out and recruit players and stuff like that inside the video game. 
That is the kind of thing that really makes me excited about Janelle Aguero. Because if I were going to build a guy in the video game, I'm going to build Janelle Aguero. Because I want my guy to be able to, to go up, play the ball in the air, have good ball skills. Doesn't have to be a ball hawk necessarily, but have really good ball skills. But I want him to be a certain tackler, and I want him to bring the thunder. Be the kind of guy who's going to set the tone and send a message when they line up to play against him. That's what Janelle Aguero is. Fast enough to run with anybody. Sure tackler. Think Greg Blue-ish when you think about the way he's going to be hitting folks this fall. And his hands... Good enough. He can play the ball in the air. Janelle Aguero is the guy that I think they're going to turn loose this year. I don't think you're going to keep him off the field. I'm very excited to see what he does and just how quickly he moves and into what position they feel is the best fit for him. And I'm looking forward to watching Aguero play this year. Julian Humphrey is another name that I'm going to be paying close attention to this year because to me, Humphrey is... It's puzzling. It's puzzling because we all know that he has tremendous ability. And in his redshirt year, most people only knew Humphrey because of his presence on social media. Then last year, when he was healthy, he started to flash and fought and scrapped and made his way onto the field for snaps that mattered in games uh, like the Missouri game. In the second half of that Missouri game, before he got injured, Humphrey looked like everything I ever thought he was going to be. Long, fast, can play the ball in the air, has great hips, and then, of course, he gets hurt. Just when I thought things were about to take off for him, he was taken out of the game. I expect Julian Humphrey to not only look good this year, but play good. And again, I mean no disrespect to anybody that he might be in competition with for that position, whether it's Dalen Everett, who I think is a quality corner in the SEC, or David Daniel Sisvana, or Daniel Harris, Chris Peel, another young name that most people have probably forgotten about. I think Julian Humphrey. When I think lockdown cover corner, I would build Julian Humphrey on the video game. I think that's what he is. The weird thing about Julian, though, and this is complete conjecture on my part, so don't get it twisted. He's a kid who loves to be in the center of what's happening. You can tell that by his personality. The thing is, some players like that only want that, and they can't back it up. But I think I've seen enough from Humphrey to know that he has been coached hard enough and has learned his lessons well enough that he's not going to be just a guy who likes the spotlight, but a guy who performs better when he's in the spotlight. When the lights come on, I think that's when Julian Humphrey's at his very best. Now, I could be completely wrong. But that's the read I get. Some dudes are the classic show up and show out kind of player. And I think that's what Julian Humphrey is. I believe what I said about the way he's taking coaching and the way he believes in what the coaches are intending to do with him this year. Because again, he went into the transfer portal. I'm sure y'all remember it. A little uh, left foot in, left foot out, hokey pokey with the transfer portal there in December. And he decided to come back. And yes, there's been coaching changes at his position. And he had a little something to say about that. I just have a feeling that this is the year that Julian Humphrey shows everybody that he should be one of the starting corners for the University of Georgia. And again, I mean no disrespect to anyone else. I just think that 12 is primed to have a breakout year for the dog. So I'm going to be paying Very close attention to that. Now, the other names, I mean, it wouldn't be a spring preview if I didn't talk about the guys who showed up mid-year, right? The new horses, 
that are out there running with the dogs this year. And the names that I, I'm going to be paying the most attention to are probably the same ones that you're going to be paying the most attention to. And I think that's going to be Ellis Robinson, who by all accounts, and I don't really love this word because in some ways I think it gets thrown around too much or maybe even it's a little disrespectful the way people use it. But by all accounts, Ellis Robinson is a freak physically. The way he's put together and the ability that he has to play the ball in the air, move his hips, sink and change direction, just his wingspan, if we're just talking about measurables, I absolutely want to see what Ellis Robinson has to say about the quarterback battle at UGA this year. I really like Dalen Everett. Okay? He took a lot of heat last year. All of that seems misplaced, in my opinion. I think Dalen Everett is a really good quarterback. I think that Ellis Robinson and Julian Humphrey are good enough to bump him out and have those two guys take the starting roles or at least compete for it, at least push for it. Let's just say Dalen Everett wins one corner. Let's say Julian Humphrey wins the other. I would put money right now and bet that um, you're going to see Daniel, David Daniel, and you would see Ellis Robinson be CB2 on either side. I think those that's going to be a fight every day, at practice, every week, throughout the season. And whoever's playing best at the time is going to be the guy that lines up for Georgia. And when they roll in the other dudes, it's not going to matter because the depth and the quality of depth is so good at that position. It's going to be fun to watch. And the guys who aren't starting or rotating in in certain packages – or even if they are rotating in, they're going to end up playing special teams and being difference makers for Georgia there as well. I am very excited about a bunch of those guys. <clears throat> and their names, excuse me, their names that I haven't even mentioned yet, like Andre Evans, who I think is going to be a monster at Georgia. Okay? I just think he's going to have to find his footing. I think it may take him a beat. I think he's going to be a fantastic football player for Georgia. DeMello Jones out of Swainsboro. That cat is a football player that I want on my team every day. And he cares about being at the University of Georgia because he's from Georgia and it means something. The future is bright in that room for Georgia. Make no mistake. But I can't talk about the DBs and new names and who I'm paying attention to without mentioning, of course, K.J. Bolden. The prize recruit in Georgia's recruiting class here for 2023. The five-star flip at the last second decided to stay home and play for the dogs. And I'm very excited to see what K.J. does this year. I've heard rumor that K.J. is the only dude that has touched 22 miles per hour on the old uh, G GPS vest thing at practice for Georgia. So there's no doubt that he is a tremendous athlete with outstanding ball skills. And as deep as this defensive back room is right now, I don't know that he's going to be able to uh, break into the starting lineup as a freshman. <clears throat> but if Mike Bobo looked over there and saw that cat not getting enough reps at safety or star or wherever they decide to put him. He is talented enough with the ball in his hands that Mike may start having flashbacks of a cat named Champ Bailey. And I'm just saying, I wouldn't be surprised if you didn't see K.J. Bolden getting the ball in his hands on special teams as a kick returner or potentially taking a sweep on offense, a reverse on offense. He's that good. Now, we'll see. I'm not saying you'll see it week one, but maybe midway through the year, somebody gets in uh, old Kirby's ear and says, hey, I need a playmaker on over on offense right now. Let's take a look at that bolding kid. Just saying.
So moving right along, <clears throat> moving right along. The next position I want to talk about, the other area I'm going to have questions is going to be about the wide receivers and the pass catchers. And obviously, we know that two of the greatest Bulldogs to ever come through Athens are no longer with the team right now. And that's fine. That's the way college football works. You don't have them forever. And the thing I want to know is who is going to be the player that flashes? Who is going to be the guy that, because there's so many people, we know everybody's going to get the ball. OK, that's the way this offense works. That's the way Carson Beck and Mike Bobo want it to work. They want to have 12, 15 people touch the ball in a game. That's fine. My question is, who's it going to be? Is it going to be the guys that are returning like Ra Ra Thomas? Like, um, <clears throat> excuse me, got a bug in my throat this evening. Uh, Dominic Lovett, Arian Smith. Anthony Evans, who we saw in the Orange Bowl, is it going to be one of those guys? Or is it going to be the freshmen that are coming in? Nitro Tuggle, Sokovi White, who is probably the best Lad McConkey comp on the team right now. Is it going to be one of those guys that's going to step up and be like, whoa, we didn't see him coming. Look at him out there making plays. Or... Is it going to be somebody out of the transfer portal? Because we know Georgia was busy there this offseason. They brought in three wide receivers to add depth to the room. And now I'm sitting here honestly asking, everybody's going to have a turn, but who's going to flash? So it's not so much that I'm sitting here today and pegging one guy as the guy that I think it's going to be. More, I'm just asking the question. The ball's going to be thrown around. I'm just curious who's going to take advantage of it. Who's going to earn the right to call for the ball? Is it going to be Dominic Lovett? Is it going to be Ra Ra Thomas? I don't know, but it's going to be fun to watch. The other thing I'm going to watch and pay attention to in the reports from, from uh, practice is who's going to be working without the football. And I know this is where Everybody points to Georgia and says, ah, ha, ha, that's why you're not going to get that five-star receiver. You're going to ask him to actually play the game of football. Misguided. That's a casual take. I'm fired up to see who's going to work without the ball. Because if you want to have an explosive offense, you have to have wide receivers and players on the edge that are going to be working down the field in the run game has to happen. Even in the pass game, how do you take a 15-yard end cut and turn it into a 45-yard game-winning touchdown? Because you've got players blocking down the field. That's how that happens. So who is going to be willing to do the work that is required of them when the ball isn't coming their way? Who's a diva and who is a great teammate? Who is about the statistics and who is about the championships? That's what I'm going to be paying attention to when it comes to the pass catching group as a whole. And I'm lumping the tight ends in with this, okay? Because there are so many names that if I spent time talking about every one of them, this thing would go for another half hour on top of what I've already got planned to talk about. So I'm paying attention to that. Who's going to flash? Who's going to work when they don't have the ball? And the other thing that I really, really do want to spend a second on here is pointing out that I think Dylan Bell should be wide receiver one right now. He's already proven everything he needs to prove. He's already shown us that he can break a game open. He's already shown us that he can go make a tough catch. He's already shown us that he can be reliable. He's already shown us that when Carson Beck trusts him to make a play for him, he will make that play. Dylan Bell has to be wide receiver one today. Now, if somebody else goes out there and beats him out for it and earns it, awesome. Because now you're going to have two studs catching the ball. They're going to line up every down for the dogs. I'll take that every day, okay? But Dylan Bell can be very, very special. For Georgia. I am very excited 
to see if he rolls out there this spring and just takes that wide receiver room, which we've already talked about, is just full of players. And again, I'm including the tight ends here. If he just takes that whole core and steps up and takes it to be, a, to use aggressive language here, if he steps up and takes it by the throat and says, I'm going to lead this group and this is how we're going to do it. I hope that that's what I see from Dylan Bell because he's already done it on the field. He's got the bona fides, okay? Turn on the tape. Just watch him play. All he has to do is step up in front of those dudes and be like, get in line, boys. We are about to take this over with Carson, and we're going to run this offense. That's what I want to see from Dylan Bell. I have zero questions about him as a player, like with the ball in his hands or, or any of that other stuff. I'm just curious if we're going to see him take that leadership role inside the room and be the guy. He's earned it on the field. He has to grow into it as a young man. So I'm very interested to see if that's what's going to happen. Because Carson Beck is going to be looking for somebody. Dominic Lovick flashed at the end of last year. Ra Ra Thomas flashed in the middle of last year. Dylan Bell was there the whole time, even splitting duties. Just making plays. That's all. Just making plays. So I'm very excited to keep an eye on that because I just don't know. That's the thing. Things are so good right now as far as numbers of bodies and what the, what it could be that it's too hard to not get overly excited about it. So I've got one more area that I want to touch on here before we get out of there, but I'll talk to you about that right after this. Y'all know we talk about champions, and that's why I want to tell you about the Premier difference with a Premier Club membership from Premier Heating and Air. Regardless of the changes that come with the seasons, winter, spring, summer, or football, some things will never change. I'm going to be comfortable in my own home, and the comfort and well-being of my family will always be my top priority. If you feel the same way, choosing Premier Heating and Air is the play to take care of all of your family's needs when it comes to keeping you cool and comfortable in your home or business. Whether you're looking to keep your current HVAC system running at peak performance, you need to replace an aging system, or you're adding on to your home and need to upgrade to a larger heating and air system, which is what I did a few years back when we built an addition onto our home, Premier Heating and Air has got you covered. Be sure to check out their Premier Club membership offer to keep your home heating and cooling systems running at peak performance and avoid costly repairs in the future. Just click the link in the description below today to get started and give yourself the gift of time, freedom, and peace of mind to focus on the most important things in your life. The choice is clear, y'all. You've just got to experience Premier. So we've already talked about the defensive line, the linebackers, the defensive backs, the wide receivers. There's one group left that's gotten a lot of run here in the offseason that I think I ought to devote a little bit of time to. And that has to be the running back room. Because when we went into 2023, the first half of the season, I mean, that was held together with bubble gum and duct tape. And that's where we first saw all of the abilities that Dylan Bell had beyond just being a tremendous wide receiver. Because he was able to step in there, he had the frame, he had the ball skills, he had the vision and the toughness to be a running back. He wanted to be a wide receiver. He is a wide receiver. He's going to be a wide receiver. But he did what was best for the team and stepped up and played running back because we didn't have any, thanks to injury. Unfortunate, but it's part of the game. This year, when we look at the running back room, just like the wide receiver room, the number of bodies is not the question. The question is, who's going to be the guy to step up there among this talented group of running backs and demand that he's in that top three when it comes to who actually gets in the game and gets the ball. Now, we're still going to be sort of, this is going to be dictated due to how injuries are coming along. Because as we all know, Branson Robinson had a, a really bad injury last year with a patella tendon when it ruptured. But for my money, just based off of what we know, if Branson Robinson is back and healthy, 
if he is able to come back in a way, say, like Nick Chubb was able to come back, I think Branson Robinson is the back that I would be most comfortable with as being number one. Now, I say that, and I'm not saying anything disparaging about Trevor Etienne, the pickup in the transfer portal from Florida. When I look at Etienne, I think that is a tremendous football player with great vision, great balance, and the potential to take it to the house. Oh, by the way, he can also catch the ball out of the backfield. So everything that I just said about Etienne helps you have an understanding for why they went and got him and why they are going to give him the ball this year. They think he can help them right away. That's the only reason you go get a guy like that. So the odds are pretty high that ETN is going to be in the rotation. The question is, who's going to be with him? And again, I, if he's healthy, for me, Branson Robinson is that guy. But we have to wait and see. Now, there are other guys there that we have to pay attention to. Roderick Robinson got some carries last year, but he's a pounder kind of back. I don't think of him as the guy who's going to take it to the house from 40, 50 yards out. Doesn't mean he's slow. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that's not his primary game. At least it doesn't appear that way. But in fairness, we haven't seen enough of him to truly know against SEC competition. Andrew Paul is a back that I really like. If in year two coming off an ACL injury, he feels like him his old self, Andrew Paul could be that guy who is essentially everything that ETN is except faster. If that's the case, then Andrew Paul is the name that everybody's going to get to know pretty quick. Of course, you've got Cass Jones back. Chauncey Bowen's recruit coming in this year. Dwight Phillips, Blazer. It's going to be very interesting to see how they use him as a true freshman, what role they see him in. The guy that's the most intriguing, though, has to be the kid that was rated as the overall uh, number one running back in the country, the number one multi-purpose back in the country for this last recruiting class. Nate Frazier out of California because he can take it to the house on the ground. He understands what it means to run between the tackles. And he is an absolute weapon in the pass game out of the backfield, which is something that Georgia really didn't have last year. And we saw with Kenny McIntosh and DeAndre Swift uh, and James Cook in years prior that that is a critical part of Georgia's offense, being able to get the ball to the back out of the backfield, and then have them make a play for you. So Nate Frazier is a name. If there were one of those freshmen that was going to get on the field early, I believe it's going to be Nate Frazier, and I think that's going to be the reason why. But again, this is just one more area that I'm going to be paying a lot of attention to here as spring practice comes up on us in a few days. I'm excited. I know that you are too. And as things pop off during spring practice, I don't know that I'm going to be coming to you every week, breaking down this happened this week or that happened, but we're going to continue to take that 10,000 foot view and sort of keep everything under the umbrella. But when things pop up that need to be talked about, rest assured that we will be here to talk about it with you because we are here with you every week. And it is because of you, the fans and followers of this podcast and this YouTube channel, that I can now say that I am so blessed and so fortunate to be able to say that we are well on our way to 10,000 subs here on YouTube. So if you appreciate, if you appreciate what we're doing, please tell your friends, send them an invitation and let them know what we're doing. Let them know to come on over here and hang out with us. And if you'd like to be able to take us with you anywhere you go, yes, this is an audio podcast as well. You can take us with you to the laundromat, to your job, to your commute, whatever it is, and check out what, whatever we're talking about that week. Don't forget, we have the newsletter. You can check that out in the description below. Be sure to sign up to keep up with everything going on uh, with the dogs. Uh, be the first person to know what's happening right there. And as always, I want to make sure that I'm saying thank you to our channel members because we cannot do this without the continued support of our channel members and the people who follow the YouTube channel and show up for us uh, each and every week. We appreciate that more than I can tell you. Until next time, I want to say thank you all for being here. Take care of yourselves. Take care of your friends. Take care of your family. And go dogs. Told them how about them dogs. That's what I told them. <laughs>